Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. My name is Matt Dameron. I serve as the Associate Executive Director here at Cedarfield, and just wanted to welcome you uh, on Wednesday, August 11th, to our weekly Wednesday chat. Um, we have some uh, updates for you as far as uh, related to COVID-19. Um, we also have Ann Hopper and Dr. Shear here to give us an update from their world. Jack uh, from our maintenance department is here. Katrin from Wellness and Leisure. And then we'll close everything out uh, with someone from our pastoral services department. So thank you so much for joining us for the next little while. We'll start out with uh, an update about our COVID-19 preparedness plan. Um, as far as a, a dashboard is concerned, we kind of use that uh, red, yellow, and green um, overall dashboard. We're, uh, we're saying that right now we're kind of in a, a yellow state. Um, we do have one independent living resident that had a breakthrough COVID-19 case um, on Monday, August 9th. There was a memo that went out um, from Michael on the 9th that was detailing this case. Uh, and I'm, I'm just gonna highlight a couple little portions here. Um, so essentially a, a breakthrough case is someone that has been fully vaccinated, but still contracts the COVID-19 virus. Uh, it is overall relatively uncommon, uh, but it does happen. And we have had that first case here at Cedarfield. So it is an independent living resident. Um, that person has been quarantining uh, since they came back from their trip. Um, and uh, in, the, in the memo, it details out kind of doing a lot of the things that we've been doing for for well over a year now, which is um, encouraging people to, especially our IL residents, encouraging, not requiring at this point, to wear masks in uh, common areas, uh, washing your hands often, and practicing social distancing uh, whenever possible. So we have been working closely with uh, the local chapter of our Virginia Department of Health as to the preparedness plan and what we need to do with this case. One of the things that um, Ann had actually pointed out to me a little while ago, we, Ann Connie McGowan, our infection control nurse, we have a lot of people requesting to be tested for COVID-19 um, that may or may not have come in, in contact with someone. At this point, the guidance is uh, still the same that it has been. Uh, for many months now. If you are symptomatic, um, we will test you. We can do it in the, in the clinic. We can do it uh, with Connie, um, our infection control nurse. Um, we will do that, but um, at this point, we aren't testing someone unless they are um, symptomatic. So um, because of that, that case, uh, we are saying that our, our dashboard is yellow at this point. Um, just going over some more general information about COVID-19, everything is on the rise. Um, these numbers, state positivity is at 7.3% right now, which is up from 6% last week, 4.7 the week before that. Henrico is at 6.5 which is up from 5.3 and up from four the week before that. You can kind of see that trend there. And Richmond City is the same way, uh, 7.5 up from uh, 5.7. So overall, um, across the nation, across the world, cases are going up. A lot of it has to do with this uh, Delta variant um, in the memo that, that Michael sent out on Monday. Uh, it was saying that the Delta variant uh, accounts for 83% of the new COVID cases. I was actually listening to the news yesterday and has gone up even more since then. Um, it's well over 90% of new cases are related to this, this Delta variant. Um, so we're just 
trying to use some of those uh, normal precautions that we've been using for, um, for the last year um, and sticking to our current preparedness plan um, until uh, we are guided to do um, otherwise. In regards to vaccination, our vaccination rate overall residents and team members here at Cedarfield is at 94%. Um, and then another memo um, related to the vaccine that went out last week on August 5th was actually from Chris Henderson, the president and CEO of Pinnacle Living. And it was directed to team members, residents, family members, volunteers, and, and contractors um, about the upcoming uh, COVID-19 vaccine mandate. So um, Cedarfield has decided to kind of take the lead with a, a couple other local senior living organizations and require that all team members be vaccinated um, as a condition of employment. So as of, as it states in this, this letter, as of Monday, September 13th, 2021, all team members and contractors must be fully vaccinated with one of the available COVID-19 vaccines as a condition of their continued employment. Um, we, we've been very successful as it outlines in this memo. Overall, as a company in general, we have been very successful in mitigating the, the COVID-19 pandemic um, across all of the communities. Resident participation in the vaccine has been over 90% um, across all of the communities. Team member participation has uh, been around 77%. Um, and, and even with that across the board, we've had very uh, few cases in the grand scheme of things compared to other organizations. But uh, unfortunately, that's still, still not enough, especially with what's going on in the world today, like I mentioned with the Delta variant. So um, we, we have decided as an organization across all of our, our communities to mandate the vaccine. So um, as of that date, September 13th, all of our team members um, that are working here will be uh, completely vaccinated. And right now, we, we've kind of gone through our list and we have a total of 61 team members that, um, that are not vaccinated at this point, um, at, least, at least officially uh, in our, our human resource records. We know that quite a few of those people have received the vaccine. We just haven't um, received a copy of their vaccination card yet, but there are quite a few people that we're still trying to get across the finish line. Uh, so we are contacting each one of those people individually to, um, to really walk them through the process and give them all of their options. Uh, Michael, uh, just today, we sent out a, um, a great frequently asked question, an FAQ sheet uh, to all of the team members, just giving some very basic information. I have it here with me actually. Um, about the vaccine, some very common questions uh, that typically hinder people from, from receiving the vaccine. So we're hoping that this, along with conversations um, from our medical team, will help get some of those people across the line and, and vaccinated before that deadline. Um, in that memo, we also um, are saying that all team members across all of our campuses, regardless of level of care, uh, need to wear um, a, a mask, preferably a, a surgical or N95 mask. Um, we, like I said at the beginning, we are encouraging independent living residents to wear masks when they're out in common spaces, but it is not required at this point. Um, and again, uh, when it comes to visitors and volunteers, we have to make sure that they're wearing their masks also uh, when in common areas. Um, the, 
vaccine clinics um, that we have. We are doing the Moderna clinics here. Uh, we have that through our pharmacy remedy. Um, and we did vaccinate um, a couple of residents and a few team members just a couple of weeks ago. With their first dose, uh, there is going to be another Moderna clinic um, on the 17th at 11 a.m. Uh, that Connie McGowan is going to be facilitating. So um, if you do need to receive the vaccine, if you're a resident, um, please contact Ann Hopper in the clinic. And if you're a team member, please contact uh, Connie McGowan and we can make sure that we get that for you. All right, that is my COVID-19 update. So next we are going to have Dr. Shear and Ann Hopper come and give us a little update. Hello, everyone. Hi, Ann. Hi, Dr. Shear. All right, we can get started. Can I get really sick with this um, Delta? variant if I was vaccinated? So, um, so this is a question we've been getting a lot. Um, I'm vaccinated, but am I going to get really sick with this Delta variant? Um, I will say based off of studies that we've had, and again, um, what we do know about is from the Singapore study, which showed that um, of people vaccinated that got COVID versus those people non-vaccinated that got COVID, 90% um, of that vaccinated group did not have symptoms at all. So, um, however, that I also feel like this population, because we have all the risk factors are usually pretty evident, um, being age and comorbid conditions such as congestive heart failure and COPD, that does increase your risk of having complications from um, COVID-19. So the the fact is that none of us have a crystal ball, but if you are vaccinated, you're much less likely to have severe symptoms. In fact, I think when I looked at the data from Henrico County, it was saying that zero vaccinated people were currently hospitalized. So that's good to know compared to, I think there was a couple thousand that were hospitalized um, that were unvaccinated with COVID-19. So that the numbers themselves show that um, that of those that are vaccinated that do get COVID-19, which is again, a small number, um, they tend not to be very symptomatic and if symptomatic tends to be more of a cough and congestion weakness, um, that which can be treated in the outpatient setting. All right, I know you don't have a crystal ball, but have you read anything about how long this Delta variant is going to last? Um, so, again, um, there's, you know, there's a gamut, um, but there is some predictions out there that say that this may only last around three months. Um, I think we were all shocked in the beginning with how long we've had to deal with COVID itself. So everything's with a grain of salt at this point. Um, but it, it may be that the Delta variant, just like, um, you know, the flu as it mutates, um, you know, we have a new flu variant every season and a couple of different variants every season. This may become a seasonal thing. This Delta variant may only be around for, you know, a few more months and then it's, it's on to, you know, to the next one. But, um, but you know, there's really, Indications say around three months, but that's not a hard and fast rule. Should I stay in my apartment and avoid social gatherings? So um, this is again a question we're getting a lot. Do I need to just go back to being um, isolated? 
The answer is no, you are in a community where you are vaccinated and uh, 97, what was that correct, the number? 97% of all the people around you are vaccinated. Um, most of you know the people that you are around and know their vaccination status as being vaccinated. So you do not have to avoid social gatherings around other vaccinated people. The transmission from vaccinated person to vaccinated person is extremely rare. Um, and they're even saying in places where there's outbreaks that they're accounting most of the cases even from um, those that are unvaccinated coming in. Um, so it's very, you know, it's, I don't, there's no indication that you need to, you know, stop going to the dining room, stop attending activities here at Cedarfield. You know, the thing that I would say is use caution. So if you're planning on going to Florida where their positivity rate is 20%, you might want to rethink the timing. Um, you know, getting on airplanes, wearing, you know, more, you know, masks out in public is necessary. Um, but again, you know, within this community, you're a lot safer here than you are in other places just based on the percentage of vaccination rate that we have here. What about if I have just gotten back from a trip or the hospital? Do I need to get tested? Um, so another good question, and the answer is no. Um, you, if you do not have known exposure with a positive person, um, then we're not testing uh, blanketly. Now this, you know, we used to test people as they came out of the hospital. That's no longer, um, that's no longer recommended. And again, as a vaccinated person, you're less likely to get it. Um, now if you start to have symptoms, yes, we're going to test you because you've now been in a higher um, risk area and you have symptoms. So if you're symptomatic, that changes. But if you're asymptomatic, even if you went on a trip, um, we're not necessarily testing you and that would not be recommended. Can you go over what breakthrough means? So we're hearing a lot about um, breakthrough cases or, um, and what does that mean? That means when somebody has a breakthrough case, so we talked about, again, these vaccines are 90% um, effective. So one in 10 person will get sick, will get COVID-19 even if they're vaccinated. So that's considered a breakthrough case because it's not typical. So when you're hearing of the percentage positivity rate and the amount of people infected are going up, you have to understand the majority of, these, of those numbers are unvaccinated. So the amount of vaccinated people getting COVID-19, even the Delta variant of COVID-19, is still very low. Um, so that's why, that's why there's a change and that's why we're not necessarily um, wanting to you know, lock everything down like they, we did in the past. Now, I do think that we need to be very careful about um, unvaccinated coming onto campus and, every, and, and you know, being around those that cannot be vaccinated um, because that's where the risk lies. I just found out someone who visits me a lot has COVID. What do I do? So, um, so again, it goes back to what is exposure? What does exposure mean? So if you have exposure to a person that ha is COVID positive, that means that you have a confirmed case of somebody that you know you visited with you were around them for a greater than 15 minute time period within a 24 hour without your mask and greater than you know and closer than six feet together so again you know those are kind of we want to make sure that you're meeting all those guidelines if in fact you have that exposure um, then we would test you within three to five days and we would want to make sure that in that time period you're monitoring yourself very closely for any symptoms and then if you have symptoms we're also testing for that so um, and if you have any questions on this because it is something that tends to be confusing and um, and there's lots of different resources that'll say different things so it's it it's you know clear as mud sometimes all this to say is you can contact um, Connie she's our infectious disease 
um, nurse that kind of uh, keeps up to date on what Henrico County is recommending, what the CDC is recommending. So she's really our resource to know up to date um, what are the recommendations for testing, you know, if there's a question of exposure. Um, so, but again, you would have to meet the criteria for exposure, the criteria for a positive person, and then also the symptoms, and at that point we would test you. Do I have to wear a mask for exercise class? So we are encouraging masks in all group settings. I think that's um, a good idea just to keep, um, to keep yourself you know, protected at the same time. You are around, you are vaccinated, the person next to you is vaccinated. Um, so there's no requirement that everyone have to wear a mask at this time. So you could attend group exercise class and not wear a mask. I would encourage you to try and stay six feet apart if you're not going to wear a mask. But at the same time, again, the transmission from vaccinated to vaccinated is still low. And although we are encouraging people to wear masks, we are not requiring people in independent living to wear masks. I'm signed up for a trip next week. Should I go? So I would say, Anne, if you're going to Florida, <laughs> I would not necessarily encourage that. I might look at um, changing your travel plans. But if you're talking about going on a trip with Cedar Field or one of the trips here, your risk is low and we need to be able to get out and see each other and we need to have that socialization. I'm not encouraging that we go back into lockdown and I hope that we don't have to. Um, so I would say that if you are, you know, if it's a trip that's here, um, we're, we're, we're taking extra precautions. We're making sure that um, the people around you are going to be vaccinated. So I would encourage you to continue to go on and, and participate in those activities. And the last one, do you have anything that you would share with family members related to COVID and their loved ones here at Cedarfield? So um, I would like to use this opportunity, just like I do all the time, to encourage more people to get vaccinated. Um, you have a story. You were vaccinated, and I think it's important that we talk to our family members about them becoming vaccinated. Um, there's a lot of media out there that's not, um, and, and incorrect information that's being circulated. Um, it's important that you share your story with your family members, and, and of those that are not vaccinated, asking the question as to why, um, and, and meeting them where they're at, um, it comes you know, the power of that recommendation is so much more powerful when it comes from somebody that you know. Um, I know I talked to my sister-in-law recently who has lupus and she was saying she wasn't going to be vaccinated because of that. And I kind of talked to her about the importance of being vaccinated because she's immunocompromised. Um, she did get vaccinated and she came back to tell me that she didn't even realize the um, the weight that she was carrying from not being vaccinated and how freeing she felt after being vaccinated. And I think that's a gift that you could be giving your family members um, that they don't even know that, 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 that is causing them stress and, and anxiety. Um, so to be able to share that, you know, you were vaccinated and, you know, maybe you had some aching or maybe you had, you know, a cough afterwards, but that, you know, you you know, you don't, there's no microchip that you're getting in your arm or anything like that. So that's important because there's a lot of misinformation out there. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shear and Ann. We appreciate it. Um, so a few more updates from me uh, before we invite Jack up here. Um, just kind of operations, concerning operations. To my left is Eleanor Moore. Uh, we wanted to, I'll scoot over so you can scoot a little closer. There we go. Um, Eleanor Moore is the new executive assistant here at Cedarfield. She actually started here on Monday with us, uh, went through general orientation today, and we'll do that again tomorrow. Uh -huh. 
I know, I know, I know, a necessary evil. Um, and she actually uh, spent the day with, or the majority of the day, with Renee yesterday. Um, and we'll do that again, what, Friday? Not so until next week. Ne next no. week, next week. So just a little bit about Eleanor. Um, most recently, she served as the executive assistant at Habitat for Humanity of the Charlotte region, reporting to the CEO. Prior to that, she served at the Augustine Literacy Project of Charlotte as the program assistant. Eleanor owned her own business for five years, designing and developing websites for small businesses, and received her Bachelor of Art in Psychology from Mary Baldwin University, near my neck of the woods. Um, and uh, I'll just read what he put here. Uh, it'll okay, embarrass you, it'll be fine. Uh, when you meet Eleanor, you will be drawn to her welcoming spirit, professionalism, and passion to serve people. Um, and you currently live in Henrico, and we really hope that you, you see Eleanor around the hallways. You might only see the eyes That's with right. the mask on. Um, but welcome her to Cedarfield. Uh, we're very excited to have her and wish her good luck. Thank you, Matt. I am so happy to be here and absolutely bowled over by the warm welcome that I've gotten. If you haven't been down the administration wing in the last three days, you've missed seeing streamers and an incredible welcome banner inside the, the executive suite there there are balloons all over and flowers and it's just um, I've never been welcomed that way anywhere before I'm just gobsmacked mm -hmm. and I do look forward to meeting everyone if I've met you I don't remember your name <laughs> so do come back again <laughs> when the dust has settled some I look forward to seeing all of you thank you so much thank Thanks, you Matt. Eleanor I told Eleanor there's only 500 residents and 300 team member names to remember. It's, it shouldn't be that big of a deal. So we're giving her a quiz at the end of the first week. Um, <laughs> so uh, thank you, Eleanor. We really appreciate it. Um, a few more updates uh, from us. Along with Eleanor going through orientation, um, we have Lauren Burnett, who is the new um, neighborhood leader in Morning Glory Avenue, our memory support neighborhood. Uh, she started today as well, again, going through that same general orientation, and we have kind of a, um, a setup for her over the next week or so, and we'll begin reaching out to families and um, meeting residents uh, so that we can give her kind of a, a safe landing and a warm welcome here at Cedar Field. Um, another update from, from Morning Glory, actually, is uh, about our OMA program. So that's O-M-A, which stands for Opening Minds Through Art. Uh, it is a program uh, out, of the, uh, out of Ohio University, which focuses on um, art um, developed specifically for the resident population with, uh, that has some form of dementia. Uh, it is a, a great program. Uh, we have spoken about it on these chats before. Um, we have met with a representative from our Innsbruck office, our corporate office, to discuss the future of that program. Aaron Chauncey, who is the recreation therapist in Morning Glory Avenue, and Fiona Ross, who is our creative arts specialist in the wellness and leisure department, um, will be going through OMA certification training this fall so that they can be official um, uh, trainers along with um, James <coughs> Torres, excuse me, who is also a certified trainer um, so that we can really get this program going specifically in our memory support uh, neighborhood. We're also working on getting a group of university student volunteers to start helping us with that program right after the first of the year. So a um, person from our, our Innsbruck office is working with us on that. So nice little uh, exciting update there. Um, all right, the pool, um, 
the pool in the new Pathways to Wellness building. I know Michael has mentioned this before. Um, it needs some work done to the, the ceiling, the roof, yes, the what? Skyline. Skyline of, of that building. Um, it is something that uh, has, has been with that building since it opened. Um, so it's kind of a, a, almost like a warranty issue kind of um, with that project. Unfortunately, that does mean we have to shut down the pool for a length of time. Um, that will begin on August 16th, so just next week. We will close the pool uh, while the contractors are in there fixing this problem. Um, we know that this is an inconvenience for the residents, uh, so that's why we are uh, working on a contract with the Tuckahoe YMCA um, to provide um, that pool amenity, um, even though it's off-site, for a little while while we're, um, we're fixing that issue. So that will start next week. Um, going into kind of the master plan, health services renovations, just giving you updates on, um, on those individual things. The assisted living dining room is back open, is officially back open. They had their um, little reopening party uh, last week. So all of our assisted living residents are dining back in that space. It's really nice um, and everyone is very happy to be back in there. Um, the third floor assisted living wing um, we kind of refer to it as the water damaged uh, wing or water damaged area. It has been offline for over a year now um, because of, of uh, a situation that happened at that time. Uh, it has reopened, the wall has come down, um, and there are two residents or a couple of residents that will be moving in uh, this week, actually the next couple of days. So they're very excited to get back to their, their former spaces um, and we're excited to help them get there. Uh, so those two are, are open. The fourth floor administration wing, which is right above that third floor area, uh, which also experienced that water damage. It's actually where my real office is. Um, that is scheduled to be ready and back open again. Um, at the end of September. Morning Glory Avenue will move back to their space, their newly renovated space. Uh, after the first of the year, it'll probably be around the February um, of 22. Um, Lavender Lane, which we ref uh, formerly referred to as Healthcare North Household, will be permanently moving to the fifth floor of the new household building. Um, the first week of August, I mean, sorry, first week of October, first week of October. Um, Medicare neighborhood still scheduled for May or June of 22. Um, uh, two sets of additional assisted living apartments, uh, 10 of them will be ready in um, November or December of, of 22. Uh, 10 more will be ready in April or May of 23. And, um, and yeah, and we're underway to get our Medicare licensure. Um, we've been working with, with consultants to get that going so that by the time that that area opens up um, in May or June of next year, we are, we are ready to go. All right, and one last thing, just to save the date, we have the big finale of our 25th anniversary, Cedarfield's 25th anniversary. Um, the grand finale is uh, September 24th, and we're essentially having a, a music festival here on campus. There's a lot of great music and food and events going on, um, so be on the lookout for that. It's going to be a, a great event uh, to kind of close out that year of celebration. All right, Jack Johnson. Hello. Um, so for August, our safety topic is um, active shooter. Um, an active shooter is someone actively engaged in or attempting to cause harm to people in a confined area. 
and in most cases using a firearm. So um, in planning and looking at this, um, we're planning to have a active shooter drill. We're working with the Henrico County uh, Police Department to be here while we conduct some drills and things to make sure our systems and, and policies and things are, are um, as good as they should be or if we need to make any changes or anything like that. So um, we're looking at the end of August, last week of August. Um, we'll know more in the next few days and I will publish that so that everybody knows ahead of time what's going to take place, how you'll be notified. Um, during the drill, you may receive a, a phone call. Well, you probably will receive a phone call from, a, from our um, SARA system, which is the um, Situational Awareness and Response Assistant. It's kind of a computer. Um, when, the, when the active shooter system is engaged or the buttons are pressed, um, it automatically just uh, sends out a phone call to everybody that's in the system, all of our residents, all of um, the team members, um, notifying us of what is taking place and where it was activated, what area. Um, so we're looking forward to this, uh, you know, drill. We want to notify everyone so they don't panic and think that it's really happening, but we want to take it seriously so that we can assess um, how we respond to what's going on and are we taking all the precautions that we can. Um, a couple things to think about um, in the event and, and trying to be prepared and, and how to respond. Um, we use the, the, the four A's. Um, the first A would be to accept what's happening in the event of, a, of an active shooter. Um, want to try to keep calm but you know accept okay this is this is taking place this is happening then then move into the second a of assess so you need to assess the situation of where you're at and what you can do um, do you have an escape route or you know is there somewhere you can you know uh, protect yourself and then you need to act yeah, um, either by running in a zigzag you know you don't want to run a straight line kind of zigzag around things um, barricade yourself in a room if you do that turn off the lights try to mute your cell phones um, once you're out of harm's way and 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 feel safe um, go ahead and call 911 and report what's going on try to give as much information of what you saw um, you know, all of that information will help to um, apprehend whoever um, it may be. Um, but, you know, in those events, you know, I know it's tough, but the best thing you can do is just be calm and get out of sight, um, get out of the way. But um, so um, there'll be a drill at the end of the month. We'll, we'll get notification out um, as, soon as, as soon as we have all the the times and dates and things and uh, we'll get that taken care of. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm here to give the lifestyles and wellness update. I wanted to start off by saying thank you to everyone that attended the Watermelon Social on Monday night. Um, it was great to see so many faces in the fellowship hall. We had almost 70 residents attend and um, we hope you all enjoyed 
all of the watermelon themed treats and Caribbean music. Um, we hope to have that group back soon. They were great. Um, and we were planning on offering one big social like this a month. We have been very happy and encouraged by the amount of interest in trips over the past couple of months, and we're continuing to offer about two trips every week. Um, every month we are trying to have a variety in the trips that we're offering um, so that they encompass different dimensions. Um, James, Georgia, Fiona, Carol, and I have been collaborating on some different trips and in-house programs that we can do together, and we're very excited for um, what's in store in the next in the upcoming months. I did want to mention that every trip that has a very long wait list, we are going to be offering those again. So just because you don't get on it this month doesn't mean you're not going to get on it the next month specifically the Hollywood Cemetery bus tour that has a very long wait list and we're just going to keep offering it every month or every other month until we um, everyone gets a chance to go on that trip. Just a reminder that James, Georgia, and I have moved into the Pathways to Wellness office across from the pool. Um, or down from the pool and one thing that has changed is that James and I used to share a phone and now we have two different extensions. So my phone number is 474-8758 and James is 474-8802. So if you're trying to reach him just call that number. Um, back in July, we began offering three pop-up events a month, and we're going to continue to do that. Um, they'll be covering certain dimensions each time, and we will put up a touchdown slide three to five days before each pop-up event. So just look out on Touchdown for updates on those events. Um, next Friday, we will have our next pop-up event. So. Again, just look on Touch Town and for those details, and we encourage you to participate in these upcoming events. So in the months to come, we'll be offering more um, in-house intellectual lectures. We are offering three in August, but we hope to have one every week going forward. Um, next Wednesday, August 18th, Dr. Kim Garrick will be coming to Cedarfield um, at 10 a.m. and she will give a presentation on brain health. Um, I encourage everyone to come to that. She was one of my favorite professors at Randolph-Macon and I'm really excited for, to see what she has prepared for us. And then in addition to increasing our lectures at Cedarfield, I wanted to highlight a few interesting programs that are happening in the next week. So every Thursday, we're offering nutrition stations in the hub. Last week, we offered yogurt parfaits and handed out brochures about the benefits of Greek yogurt. So tomorrow, we're having our next one at 9.30 to 10.30. Um, just stop by and grab a fruit and cheese cup and or after your workout or just to chat with your neighbors and later in the month we're offering two afternoon snacks so feel free to come by and grab one of those. To, yeah, tomorrow night resident run bingo is taking place in the fellowship hall so stop by and play for some prizes. And for evening entertainment, we're excited to have Mina and David McAllister um, next Monday evening, the 16th. So come to the Fellowship Hall and listen to this duo. They've been singing together for over 25 years. And lastly, we love receiving program and outing suggestion forms. So please continue to fill these out with your ideas and we'll try our best to get those on the calendar. Um, these are located in the in-house mail room or you can call with your ideas too. So if you ever have any questions, feel free to stop by our office or call. We look forward to seeing everyone in the upcoming events. Thank you.
Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Trish Carter, the Chaplain Manager, and it's time for a spiritual focus. I wanted to read to you a short little snippet from a sermon that I was in Chapel Hill in the early uh, 1990s, and I found this piece of paper taped to a coffee shop window. And on it was a little note from the owner of the coffee shop who said something like, wisdom from my priest. And I thought, I wonder what this says. And it's called a thought. But if we carry that true peace of Christ within, how has it made our world more peaceful? I cannot ask you to drive out the warring factions of Lebanon. That is unreal. But I can ask you, what wars have you ended on your own hallway or in your own backyard? What minds of envy or hate, of discord or dislike, have you diffused in your own bedroom. Who hurts less because you love more? Who hurts more because you love less? Who was distressed but has come alive at your touch? Is anyone free to laugh because you have swallowed your pride? Who was hungry for food or affection and is fed by your faith? Who thirsts for justice and feels more human because you are there? Who experiences God's absence and finds the image of God on your face? My friends, the paradox of peace is that by opening our hearts to others, we come to experience the peace of Christ at last. It must be shared. It must be given away to others. Have a great afternoon.